Good morning, everybody. First of all, thanks to the organization team for inviting me to this session. And it is for me a pleasure to introduce our next speaker and his keynote on this very important subject that is concrete in a carbon neutral economy. Bernard Mathieu is a chemical engineer from the University of Liège in Belgium and holds a management degree from the ICHEC Business School in Brussels. Bernard Mathieu has a very rich 23 years experience in cement, concrete and aggregate businesses in various positions. He was successively Director of Environmental Sustainability at Heidelberg Cement, Senior Vice President Sustainable Development at Olsim and Lafarge Olsim, and Director of Climate Program of the World Cement Association. He is now working as an independent consultant for various companies and associations, supporting them in their low carbon transition. Bernard actively took part to the several, to several UNFCCC climate change conferences, like the COP18, 21, 22, and 23. And he is also chairing the Association Engineers Without Borders for Belgium, Engineers Sans Frontières Belgique, which delivers a technical support to develop projects in various African countries. So now, Bernard, you have the floor, and I will uh, give after some question from uh, the public. Thank you. Thank you, Sandrine. Good morning. I hope you can hear me properly. My presentation this morning is indeed about, um, about the challenge um, for the cement and concrete industry, the challenge of the upcoming three decades to achieve carbon neutrality. Um, the, the Paris Agreement signed in um, 2015 sets this goal of carbon neutrality for the overall economy by 2050. Um, and it's also today a goal which was taken over by, by, the, by the European Union, uh, which aims at being the first carbon neutral continent by 2050. Um, how will the cement and concrete sector evolve between now and 2050 to adapt to this new context. Concrete is today not carbon neutral, um, and we will see the figures. How will we have to change, to adapt, to transform the sector? Um, it has become for this sector um, a, an existential challenge, not only obviously for the concrete sector, for many other energy intensive industries, but more specifically, for this building material, for the building material we are working, we are working for, it's it's indeed an existential challenge, and that's what I will that's what I will present you um, today. Um, my experience, uh, Sandrine described it. I worked I worked for several cement companies, uh, Heidelberg Cement, Holcim, Lafarge Holcim, um, and then for the World Cement Association. Um, and now as, as independent consultant for different um, European associations and uh, companies which are in a way or another working or acting um, to, to facilitate this, this transition, this transformation to low carbon, carbon neutral uh, materials and construction. The first, yeah, this first slide is somehow uh, my, my, my belief. <laughs> uh, concrete is today the most used building material in the world. Concrete is the most consumed resource on the planet after water. And, and it will remain so in the upcoming years. It will remain so because we still see um, this uh, rapid move from, from populations to cities, to large cities, 1.5 million people joining cities every week on this planet. Um, we see these massive needs for housing, for infrastructure, and, and we know that concrete has unique properties um, which, uh, which can indeed contribute to deliver the services that people and populations need um, around the world. Uh, so this will remain. The question is, how can we 
reconcile this massive demand for housing, for infrastructure, and this requirement to reduce carbon footprint, to reduce our impact on climate, um, and to achieve carbon neutrality. That's, that's, the, that's the old challenge the sector is facing. Um, global warming is there. Probably you noticed it. <laughs> Probably you noticed it. This picture is already a, a picture, I think, a quite old one from 10 years ago. Um, there are still people, obviously, who don't believe in global warming. It's not a question of believing or not believing in it. Um, it's, it's a fact. We see climate change taking place um, around us. Um, you probably noticed it this year. Uh, I was I was amazed this year to see to see the the my my garden <laughs> during during the springtime to see um, to feel these these very high temperatures that we had um, uh, during this summer. Um, Ban Ki Moon from from the UN uh, said a few years ago that we are the first generation which can end poverty and the last generation which can end climate change. It's probably a bit optimistic to say that we can end climate change, but at least we can still limit climate change and we can help avoid the most severe consequences um, from this change, from this overall warming that we see in our climate. And this, and this fact, um, this need, this requirement to avoid the most severe consequences of climate change has massive consequences for many industrial sectors and amongst others, the cement and concrete sector. So that's what I'm going to describe here. What is the extent of the challenge for the global cement and concrete sector? First, um, Early, early this year, um, like every year, the World Economic Forum, and you know that they meet once a year in Davos, uh, in Switzerland, the World Economic Forum released its yearly global risks report. And what you see there is that, um, is that it's already a few years that climate change, biodiversity loss, extreme weather, natural disasters, so all these aspects which are somehow related to the change we see in, in our climate are ranked by the members of the World Economic Forum as being the most critical risks for the economy of the world. Um, and, and as you see there on the left-hand side, climate change is striking harder and more rapidly than many expected. And the risks that we are facing are obviously a loss of life, but also social and geopolitical tensions and negative economic impacts. Interestingly enough, so this report is from January 2020, um, just before the, let's say, the COVID uh, crisis uh, that we have been facing since then. And, and you will see, let me try to, um, to get my laser there. You will see that infectious diseases were ranked there um, as, a, as a risk with high impact, but uh, relatively low level of likelihood. So um, somehow it was, it was on the graph. It was on the graph. Um, and, and this risk obviously materialized strongly this year. And we will, we will see later, you know, we will at least raise the question later of what will be the impact of this, um, of this health crisis on the ability and of the on the focus of the world on on long-term issues like climate change good now uh, despite this uh, these risks and despite the fact that many and many people are very aware about the the importance and the criticality of climate change we still see global co2 emissions growing and you have there the figures from the International Energy Agency, and you see indeed that by 2019, um, the, the global CO2 emissions still raised a bit compared to 2018, with um, a smaller part for so-called advanced economies and a higher part for, for the rest of the world. 
So we are not making the efforts we need. We are, we are very clearly not in line, uh, not aligned towards the objectives of the Paris Agreement. If we come to the construction sector and to the cement sector itself, um, it is estimated that around 40% of energy related CO2 emissions comes from buildings and construction. It comes from the operation phase, the operating phase of building, 28%. But this part is decreasing because buildings are better designed, better insulated. Um, um, yeah, installations are more efficient also in buildings. And, but the part, on, the, part related on build, the part related to the construction phase itself and to the building materials, uh, the embodied CO2 in building materials is relatively increasing. 6% from the global CO2 emissions come from cement. So this figure is now um, can, be, can be discussed. Some people say five, some people say 8% of the total uh, CO2 emissions of this world come from the cement production process, it's still a very high share. Um, and it's equivalent, for example, to the total emission of India, which is obviously not, not, not a small country on, on this planet. So cement is, indeed, um, cement is indeed responsible for a significant part of, of the global CO2 emissions. What is interesting to, to see is also that, um, yeah, the, the, the global building stock will have to increase strongly over the upcoming decades. Most of the buildings we will need by 2050 are not yet built. Um, and, um, and we will have to manage a transition where today a very small part of these buildings are net zero energy. Um, and we will have to make sure at the end of the day by 2050, if we want to go fully for, for, for carbon neutrality, we will have to make sure that 100% of these buildings are actually achieving a very high uh, energy performance. So that's, that's the whole extent of the, of the challenge for the, for the construction sector. If we now focus on the cement sector, um, the cement sector, the global cement sector, has established um, a very high level of transparency on its CO2 emissions. It's quite unique, actually. So um, many cement companies, and I would say international cement groups, are very openly reporting their CO2 figures into a global database. They all apply the same protocol. Uh, they all apply the same protocol. So figures from Lafarge Sim, CRH, Heidelberg Cement, and the, let's say, and many other cement groups are absolutely comparable. Um, if, if you go to their sustainability report and have a look at their CO2 figures, they are absolutely comparable. They are calculated according to exactly the same uh, protocol. And they are reported every year into a global database. And in what we see from this global database, which is called GNR database, um, is that the CO2 intensity, meaning the CO2 emissions per ton of cement, has been increasing over the past few years. So we are not on the right way. We are not on the right path. It has been increasing um, by 0.6%, while um, if we want it to be on track, with the so-called sustainable development scenario of the International Energy Agency, we would need uh, a 0.7% decline per year to 2030. So if, 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 I, yeah, if I want to give a bit more details about that, the International Energy Agency established, has established roadmaps, low carbon roadmaps for each of the major industrial sectors so there is a roadmap dedicated to the cement sector, which defines, um, which defines targets by 2030, 2040, and 2050, improvement targets according to different scenarios, and which also define what should be done, so how these targets should be achieved. Um, and indeed, um, every year, the International Energy Agency releases a so-called tracking report for each of these industrial sectors. 
So in June 2020, if you go to the website of the International Energy Agency, you will find the tracking report for the cement sector um, with a clear message, more efforts needed. Um, the thermal energy density must fall considerably, bioenergy use must increase. It, it, the, the IEA also underlines that today, the clinker to cement ratio, so the percentage of clinker, the CO2 in intensive component of cement compared to cement has been increasing, which is exactly the opposite of what should be done. Um, they still notice that innovation efforts are being made. Low carbon innovation is advancing, particularly for CCU, carbon capture and use, or CCS, carbon capture and storage. And finally, they insist on the fact that um, regulators um, should act with more energy and more ambition to help decarbonize the cement sector. So you see already that all these reports are being made public. Um, the cement sector is, um, is clearly under the loop. Um, big cement players do know, that, uh, do know that all these messages are released to public authorities and to NGOs and to public opinion in general, which create obviously um, a certain level of pressure on these, on these players. But the pressure also comes from investors, from the financial markets. What we see now is, is, a, is a clear requirement from investors, from a growing number of investors to be transparent. So they want more and more companies to be very clear and very transparent on the risks and the opportunities that they face related to climate change. There is a, um, there is a protocol, there is now a guideline, which is called TCFD. It's a guideline from this task force on climate related financial disclosure, TCFD. And this guideline is not yet mandatory, but you will see more and more companies and uh, amongst other cement companies reporting every year, according to these guidelines, what are the financial risks and the financial opportunities related to the low carbon transition. I, I show there a graph from the TCFD, I will not enter into details, but, um, but that's indeed a, a guideline which is now being followed by more and more companies. And, and um, there also, companies are being ranked. Companies uh, are, are being ranked in terms of performance, in terms of financial risk and financial opportunities. So every year, you will have several independent bodies um, ranking companies on their um, financial risk and opportunities related to, cl to climate. It's, it's particularly the case, obviously, in a, in a sector such as the cement sector with a high exposure to climate risks. So you see there that, obviously, in this graph, you have so-called vulnerable uh, and so-called resilient companies. Um, so it gives an idea to investors of, of where they should invest their money in terms, at least, of resilience to uh, to the upcoming, um, let's say, transition, low carbon transition, and to the risk and opportunities related to this transition. So co some companies um, rank better than others because they have been taken, they have been taking measures to reduce their CO2 footprint, or because they have innovative products, innovative binders, cements, concrete, which can. Um, which can help profile themselves on the market as leaders in the uh, low carbon transition of the construction sector. Um, so these rankings are released every year and I can tell you that they are looked at in, in details but by, uh, by the um, managing boards and by the CEOs of these, of these different companies. The public awareness has been quickly rising. So, you know, I, I give here, I show here a picture of, of Greta Thunberg. One can discuss about the role and, and, and the way Greta Thunberg has been, has been conveying her messages. But at least uh, we have seen a huge impact. We have seen climate demonstrations um, all over the world and all over Europe. And, um, and it's clearly reflected today, you know, in, um, in, in companies 
um, many companies are now getting a bit frightened of their level of, or at least of their capacity to attract and to retain the best talents um, if, if they are not able to show and to showcase, to demonstrate that they can, that they really take the climate issue seriously. So indeed, um, you have this increasing pressure from all sides to come towards companies. Customers, it's still, I would say in the construction sector, it's unfortunately still limited. Um, the, the, the pressure from, from, the, from contractors or from customers of cement and concrete companies on climate performance is still quite limited to a niche. Um, a niche of, of customers with, with high requirements, but still uh, it's a trend that we see. We see more and more buildings which are certified according to green standards. Uh, you also have um, now uh, certification schemes for concrete itself. And, um, and these schemes include some requirements on CO2, on CO2 performance, or at least on CO2 emission management of companies. So it's, it's a fact that companies have to take into account. I, told, I just talked about the, the ability to attract and to retain the best talents. And today, if you want to attract and retain, for example, young engineers or young technicians, um, you have to be able to explain your strategy to show your actions um, on, on the climate issue. And finally, overall, there is this growing awareness of the public, of the public opinion. Um, there is a requirement of transparency and accountability towards large companies. And you even have in some countries court cases. You even have in some countries companies being attacked by NGOs um, in courts or tribunals um, to because, because these companies were accused to uh, endanger life and even to um, somehow um, from a human rights issue to have a negative role on society due to their CO2 emissions. So we have seen a multiplication of court cases in several countries. So this, this overall context creates obviously um, a pressure on high CO2 emitting sectors. And, and these sectors, including the cement sector, sh should then change, should then adapt within the next decades. One of the challenges the sector is facing is the investment challenge. You know, if you want to transform a sector such as the cement sector, that, should, that would also be valid for the steel sector or for the glass sector. If you want to transform it within 25, 30 years to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050, you have to take into account one additional issue, which is that it's a capital intensive sector. Um, usually, if you want to invest in a new cement kiln or in new cement grinding units, you need to mobilize massive financial resources from capital markets. And uh, you need afterwards a high volume of production over a long period of time to provide an adequate, a sufficient return on investment. Which means that the investment cycles are long. You know, if you invest in a new cement kiln, you will not revamp it or change it 10 years afterwards. Um, usually an investment cycle in the cement sector for, for big installations, it's at least 25, 30 years, sometimes 40 years. So the cement industry only has one, maximum two for some smaller devices, rounds of investment between 2050. Which means that, um, you know, if we want to be carbon neutral by 2050, um, the technologies or the new technology, the innovative technologies we need should be extremely quickly identified so that if, if there is a need today to, or within, within the next few years, to revamp an installation, that it is being revamped with these best performing low CO2 uh, technologies 
because they will not be changed anymore between, before 2050. So there is this, this issue of long investment cycle, which also has to be, to be considered. <clears throat> As I told you previously, the International Energy Agency has released uh, a, local, a technology roadmap for the cement sector. It's available on their website. It describes what needs to be done between now and 2050. Um, and it also gives ideas of total level of investments which, um, which are related to these, uh, these transformation. Um, quickly said, obviously this, this uh, roadmap is based on assumptions, assumptions in terms of cement production volumes. I think this graph can be interesting to see. Um, you know, it is estimated that, uh, yeah, between 2014, which was the reference here, and 2050, it is estimated that the cement volume in China will drop dramatically, but that overall there will still be a slight increase globally of the cement volumes due to India, due to some other developing countries. And, and you see that the share of, of Europe there is, is relatively stable relatively stable and, and, and quite limited, obviously, in terms of total cement production volumes. So what needs to be done, what needs to be done is obviously to, to make sure that uh, low CO2 technologies, low CO2 techniques are being deployed in these emerging markets where massive production volumes will, um, will be delivered over, next, over the next period. Um, and, you know, quickly say, um, this roadmap of the International Energy Agency defines uh, a so-called two-degree scenario and a so-called below two-degree scenario. We know that now, you know, scientists and, um, yeah, climate scientists do insist on, on a below two-degree scenario. But even in a two-degree scenario, um, the cement sector would have to cut um, its CO2 emissions by 32% by 2050 versus 2014. If you go to a below two degree scenario, then you really have to cut the emissions by four. Um, so these, um, these are massive cuts. Um, and we will see that these cuts cannot be achieved only by technologies or techniques which are available today. Innovation is needed. Indeed, in order to achieve this transformation, the cement sector must reduce the share of fossil fuels. So it must replace um, coal and pet coke, which are the most used fossil fuels for the, um, in, in cement kilns, in clinker kilns, by um, waste derived fuels, so-called alternative fuels, which have a lower CO2 emission factors, and biomass fuels, usually secondary biomass fuels. It has also to reduce its clinker cement ratio. And it is estimated in the roadmap that it is feasible to reduce the clinker cement ratio to substitute more clinker by, um, by a variety of clinker substitutes. Um, it is estimated that it's feasible to reduce it to 0 0.6, uh, so 60% clinker in uh, cement in average globally. But even if the sector does this, and we have seen that we are not always on the right way, um, it will not be enough. It will not be enough. These validated techniques and technologies will help achieve 50% of the reductions we need. So with these validated technologies, we will be able to achieve 50% of the CO2 emission reductions we need to be on a two degree scenario. So there is a so-called technology gap, um, and this technology gap requires massive efforts of the sector uh, and of, of all its partners, its innovation partners in, um, in innovation. What can it mean? It can mean uh, a better efficiency in the use of building materials, and there is, there, there is a big potential, obviously, 
to better use cement, to better use concrete, um, so that you can achieve a higher material efficiency and reduce the CO2 footprint of a given structure or a given uh, building. Um, it has to invest in developing new types of clinker or new types of cement, meaning uh, for new types of cement, new clinker substitutes. And finally, carbon capture and storage or carbon capture and use, but it will obviously mainly be carbon capture and storage, will be needed to achieve the level of ambition uh, of, of the IEA roadmap. Um, a short overview, I will come back on innovation and I will give some examples of what is being done today. Uh, but first, a short overview of regulations uh, in, in a few, just in a few minutes. Um, the regulatory framework, perhaps you know this culture in Berlin, um, on the main square in Berlin, a very tiny sculpture uh, on the ground, uh, which is called Politicians Debating Climate Change. Indeed, it has been a very long and long lasting uh, issue. Um, actually, um, I remember that my first presentation to, um, to the board of my company uh, related to CO2 was in 2001, so almost 20 years ago. And, um, and we have been facing a very slow and chaotic development of, of regulations, which are still not fully settled, I must say. Um, but what is important to, to, to see is that uh, we have a growing number of countries, it's a bit messy this slide, but we have a growing number of countries which put a price on carbon. So in 2019, we had 46 national jurisdictions and 28 subnational jurisdictions which are putting a price on carbon. So countries, regions where indeed um, citizens or companies have to pay a price for their CO2 emissions. It represents 22.6% of the global CO2 emissions. And obviously in Europe, in Europe, you have the emission trading scheme, which means that in Europe, large industrial sectors in the European Union, large industrial sectors have to pay or have to at least have to purchase um, emission allowances, so emission certificates for, uh, for their CO2 emissions. What we have seen over the past few years is an increase of uh, of, um, of the price of CO2, EUA is for uh, European Union allowances. The price of CO2 has been increasing. You have seen a drop due to the COVID crisis and to the lockdown, but in between the price has come back to, uh, to its previous level. So today, or I would say two days ago, um, the price was of 27.5 euros per ton of CO2. The price has been increasing and uh, the amount of allowances uh, which are given for free to big emitters and big companies, this amount has been decreasing. So it's, it's, um, it's a growing cost for large industrial companies, including for cement companies, which, which is obviously an incentive to change, an incentive to innovate, an incentive to um, to develop low carbon solutions. The only issue we are facing, or we are facing many issues, but one of the issues we are facing is that today, um, this price is only valid for producers um, producing cement in Europe. So importers are not yet paying or are not covered by the EU emission trading scheme. Only local producers are covered by the EU emission trading scheme which obviously create an incentive, uh, if the price gets too high, create an incentive to relocate production outside of Europe. There are now political debates, you may have heard about it, to have a carbon tax um, at the borders of the European Union so that, so that you can create a, a level playing field and fair competition um, between local producers and importers. 
And then you have the European Green Deal with the new Commission uh, and with Ursula von der Leyen. Uh, when she arrived at the European Commission, she she really pushed this green agenda as a way to um, let's say so to reposition the EU uh, as as you know a, a, a political body addressing critical issue and critical concerns from citizens. High ambitions uh, in terms of CO2. Uh, CO2 emissions cuttings, uh, transforming Europe into the first climate neutral continent by 2050. What is important to see um, in, the, in, the, in the text of the Green Deal, if you have a look at the text of the Green Deal, is that uh, the Commission insists on the fact that energy intensive industries are indispensable to Europe's economy. Modernizing and decarbonizing energy intensive industries must be a top priority. And, um, and that the presence of, of these industries and of entire value change on the European territory is important to increase the resilience of our society to unexpected events and crises such as the COVID crisis. Um, so interesting to see there is a recognition that these traditional or so-called traditional sectors are also important and that, and that um, and that the EU should also invest in innovation efforts of these traditional sectors because they are indispensable to, to the Europe's economy. So the European Gilding is being developed. Uh, we know that it is now impacted by the COVID also, that some of the fundings which were originally meant for the Green Deal have been shifted to um, recovery plans or to support to the countries which suffered the most from COVID. So we will see over the next months how this will all evolve. So the, the, these were a few words on the regulatory framework, which, was, which is still moving. Um, and finally, I will, I, will, um, I will try to show you what the cement sector can do, should do, or must do to address the climate challenge. Um, SEM Bureau, the European Association of the Cement Sector, released, uh, I think, two years ago, its 5C strategy. So actually, if you want to, as a company, if you want as a company to address this issue, you have to think about reducing CO2 emissions from the clinker production process, reducing CO2 emissions from the cement production process, from the concrete production process, reducing, um, or let's say, um, addressing the overall CO2 footprint from construction, and finally, also taking into account carbonation, because concrete is a building material which carbonates during its lifetime. Um, that's something which was usually not appreciated, because as you, as you, as you, as you know, this, this uh, raises some issues in terms of, of durability. Um, but uh, this carbonation is also um, now used to position concrete as a as a carbon sink during its lifetime, um, and and this can be this can be a useful uh, useful way to actually uh, recalculate uh, life cycle CO2 emissions of concrete. Let's say more favorable figures for life cycle and CO2 emissions of concrete. So, uh, what should the con what should the sector do? Clearly, there are very few, there is a very small remaining improvement potential from investment in energy efficiency, because most of the kilns that we have today, most of the cement plants that we have today are close to best available techniques, not all, but most. Um, alternative fuels must be deployed, uh, uh, waste derived fuel, biomass fuels must be deployed further. And I would say outside of Europe, because Europe is the continent where you have a very high level of fuel substitution, fossil fuel substitution. In the rest of the world, it's not yet the case. And clinker substitution is undoubtedly the most powerful lever to reduce CO2 emissions in the currently existing technologies. Uh, but by what will you substitute clinker? So what are the substitutes that you can use in cement um, to reduce the clinker content? And, uh, and there the availability of these substitutes is, is clearly a factor. Um, 
So you have here a, a visual with, with the total availability of materials, of various materials, which can be used as a substitute for clinker. We know that slag from blast furnaces and fly ashes from uh, power plants have been used for many years as clinker substitutes. Um, they have a limited availability globally. Uh, if we want really to substitute clinker to a large extent, we have to uh, come back, or let's say, we have to consider materials with very high global availability. And that's why today there is a, a clear focus, and you will find it in the, in the IEA roadmap, a clear focus on calcined clays. Um, calcined clays combined in some cases with limestone, you might have heard of the LT3 project, which is uh, driven by the EPFL in Switzerland. Um, it's, uh, it's clearly recognized as one of the, prom let's say, promising avenues to, to further substitute clinker, uh, even if there are still some open questions on, on this one. Uh, material efficiency, of course. So actually what companies should do is to continue to focus on concrete quality. I mean, it's today not acceptable that in some countries and mainly in countries where cement is being sold in bags uh, to individuals um, that, that the quality of concrete remains in average so low and that the lifetime of concrete buildings and concrete structure is, is indeed much too short. Concrete should be used for long lasting structures and, uh, and, um, and, and buildings. Um, so training, educating users is, is essential. In terms of material efficiency, obviously high performance concrete uh, can help, can provide a reduction of, of the CO2 footprint of the final structure. And uh, one should also more and more go to performance-based standards. So norms and standards which are based on performance and not on composition, uh, so that it gives more flexibility for innovation with one single objective, minimizing the use of clinker in the final structure because it's the use of clinker which will, it's the percentage of clinker which will determine the uh, overall CO2 footprint of the final structure mainly. Um, just a word to say that, you know, if you want to be efficient, if you want to indeed to achieve the lowest possible carbon footprint of the, of the concrete structure of the building of the infrastructure, there is an absolute need which is to work together which is to work together between architect, engineers, contractors, material supplier, um, et cetera, et cetera. In some cases, it can be that, you know, a high performing cement with a high, with a higher footprint per ton of cement will actually reduce, result in a much lower CO2 footprint for the final structure, because you will have to use much less, much less of this cement, um, quickly said. So indeed working together uh, from the diff in the different phases of, from the design uh, of the building till the delivery and the use phase and the deconstruction of the building, uh, rethinking this whole process together will help make um, important steps and, and massive savings in terms of, uh, of uh, CO2. Carbon capture and storage, carbon capture and use um, are, being, are being studied. So you have a lot of ongoing projects uh, in Europe, but also in Northern America and in China. I give here a few examples of ongoing projects um, in the European countries. Most of them are being supported by the EU, uh, by the way. And, um, and, and more interestingly, on the next slide, um, end of June, so by the end of June this year, it was announced that um, Heidelberg Cement um, in Norway um, has signed an agreement uh, with an equipment supplier for the supply of a, an industrial scale CO2 capture, liquefi liquefaction and storage facility. So there you would have 400,000 tons of CO2 captured annually and transported for permanent storage. So it would be, uh, as far as I know, the first industrial scale carbon capture plant at a cement production facility. So things are moving indeed on this front. Um, things are moving also in terms of marketing and branding from green products. Um, a recent example from Lafarge Olsim where 
there was a recent announcement that they will launch a global brand for low carbon concrete with different levels, you know, from, from let's say an entry level product till, um, till what they call eco pack zero. So concrete with zero, um, uh, with a zero carbon footprint, which means that they also offset the remaining CO2 emissions through certified environmental projects available on, on, the, on, the, CO2, on the CO2 market. Um, other other example of, of innovation in the sector, um, electrification of the production processes. Uh, so there was a project between a, a subsidiary of Heidelberg Cement and, uh, and an energy producer to electrify the cement production process. So to replace these big uh, kilns, these big clinker kilns in which um, cement producers are directly injecting a variety of fuels to replace them by an, by an electric process. Um, and, and they are making progress in this. It's still, uh, it's still obviously much less advanced than CCSCCU, but, uh, but who knows, this could be part of the solution on the long run. Um, and these are just few examples, but on this slide, um, I, show you, I show you the long list of innovation areas, which has recently been accepted, which has been accepted by the EU Commission for the future partnership processes for planet. It's a partnership between the, the EU Commission and eight industrial sectors, the steel sector, the chemical sector, the lime sector, and amongst other, the cement sector. So um, this new public-private partnership, which will be the follower, the successor of SPIRE, um, um, will, focus, will focus its activities on these innovation areas, which all aim at achieving carbon neutrality and circularity in these energy intensive sectors. So I will not go further into details, but if you have a look at processes for planet on the website of the EU Commission, you will have um, many more information on that. Last word on innovation to say that uh, recently, um, the Global Cement and Concrete Association has announced the creation of a global cement and concrete network, Innovandi, which is again focusing on low carbon and transition to carbon neutrality. With 30 companies, um, cement producers, but also equipment suppliers or, um, or admixtures producers, 30 companies, 40 scientific institutions, organizing regular events and conferences, uh, the overall goal is, is indeed, again, to, to boost innovation and, and obviously this is, this is needed. Uh, the, the cement sector was obviously not always the most, <laughs> the most uh, innovative sector or the quickest to adopt innovation. We see that uh, there, is, there is very obviously a growing, a growing concern and a growing interest to, to change, to transform. Now, a few conclusions, and my conclusions will be mainly open questions towards the future. The first one, um, yeah, will, will public authorities, will regulators be able to coordinate their efforts so that we have in place a, a good, an efficient, a consistent regulatory framework to have a managed transitions towards carbon neutrality, because obviously, some will win, some will lose. How will we make sure that it is also socially accepted by, by our citizens? And what will be the impact of COVID-19 on the political will to address climate change? Um, you know, it's, it's illustrated there by, by this, small, this small picture. Um, what will be, you know, if, if, we, if, we, if we are now facing um, a recession, um, um, a massive economic crisis, what will be um, the remaining political will to address this long-term issue of climate change? It's, it's, uh, it's a very open question at this phase. I don't think, 
I don't think we can still have a very clear idea, but obviously over the next few months, we will have to see if, uh, if, we, if we are able to have also a look at the long term. Um, now, will the industry be able to innovate and to invest within the next three decades? Will, will, this, will this global industry be able to transform itself in such a short time frame? This would be an unprecedented pace of transformation for, the, for an industry such as, such as the cement industry, but also the construction industry. Next question, will we see, will we see new business models? I believe we will. Uh, see new business model, we start seeing new business models. We start seeing more integrated construction companies with a shift in value creation towards downstream activities. We start seeing companies, you know, which uh, actually will only produce building materials when they need it, but which will create their, their value and most of their value in, um, in, in the downstream products, downstream activities. Dematerialization in the construction sector is also an interesting topic. Um, yeah, there, there, are, there are many possible, possible new business models to be deployed in the future. So, um, but concrete will remain concrete. So how will concrete in 2050 look like? So we hope, and I think it will remain a very inspiring building material. Um, it will be probably a material with even more intelligence than today. Um, but what is, what is sure is that in my view, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm personally very passionate about concrete, you know, I'm organizing my holidays <laughs> I'm organizing my holidays to to take pictures of the nicest uh, of the nicest brutalist concrete buildings one can find. So I think I think concrete will remain this uh, this uh, beautiful, durable, safe, resilient building material that our society needs. It will have to transform itself, but uh, but I think and I believe we can remain optimistic. Um, we can remain optimistic about the future of this building material itself. So that was it from my side. Thank you very much, uh, Bernard. That was a very interesting uh, presentation. And not very easy for a breakfast uh, meeting, but uh, we are uh, 72 participants to this uh, session. So I'm very glad to see um, so many people today. So I remind you, if you have any special uh, question, you can put on the chat or question and answer. And, um, and I will start uh, with uh, some uh, first comment on your and uh, start the discussion. Uh, we will have, if you uh, agree about 15 to 20 minutes of uh, question. Yeah. Um, so because uh, now it's uh, nine uh, o'clock, 9.53. Um, I think you highlighted something very important is that uh, the transparency on the data of the cement industry for the CO2 uh, footprint. This is um, not necessarily easy to open the door of the cement plant and the data like uh, carbon. And this may be a threat, but I believe all the players for industry of cement play the game of the climate change and say, okay, we have this footprint and now let's see together how we can uh, uh, mitigate uh, the climate change. And as you showed many, um, different way of doing. It has already been done many things from, uh, the from now, from the past to now, and we see that it's not enough and now we have to do more. And I believe there are two ways of doing more, as you say, but what is very important is 6%, okay, 5 or 8% of CO2 footprint in, um, in, the, in the world. Um, is, all, is a lot, but it's also, if we can do something, it's a real way to act. So what every step we can do in the better way will be a big step for all the planet. So this is very important. And to see that cement is worldwide 
the same, more or less the same project and more or less the same processes. And there is one way of doing new innovation, but also you highlighted that some countries and Europe is a leader on some new technologies. So how do you believe Europe uh, can transfer the technology they have now for producing clinker, for making new cement or new concrete, and how they can accelerate this transfer in the rest of the world? Um, good question. So, I think um, so. If you if you have a look at at the at the, <coughs> at the picture of the world today for the cement sector, Europe is leading clearly on some of the let's say low carbon technologies or practices. Europe is leading clearly on the use of alternative fuels. So, actually, Europe is almost the only continent where. Uh, where uh, coal and pet coke are significantly replaced by um, fuels with lower with a lower carbon footprint. In Average is about forty percent. I mean, I, it is in yeah. France. Yeah, indeed, indeed. I would say it's about. Uh, I, I should have a look at the latest figures, but the average is forty-five to fifty percent of, of 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 fuel substitution. I would say, while if you have if you have a look at Asia, they are still. In the order of magnitude of zero to five percent, you know, very very small yeah. level. Uh, also in the U.S., obviously, also due to 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 the cost and to, and to the price of of fossil fuels. Um, so this is uh, an asset for Europe. Clinker substitution is also an asset for Europe. I mean, Europe is the continent where um, clinker has been has been replaced for decades already, to a large extent, by blast furnace slag or fly ashes. Um, even and new standards are coming because you have heard about this uh, European standard that was blocked for three or more five years, and now yeah. uh, the cement player are making a deharmonized standard uh, in order to put more uh, substitution of uh, clinker. Yeah, exactly, and 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 also to enable these calcined clay cement to be deployed. So um, there is the. Um, th these are two strengths of Europe. If you have a look at energy efficiency of installations, uh, it's, it's much better in China. Um, uh, it's much better in China because simply because our, our cement plants are older. <laughs> our cement plants are older and the cement plants in China have been massively revamped during the boom, um, during the Chinese boom, which is now, you know, slowing down. Um, but um, I would say, in terms of innovation, um, the, it's very, for me, it's very, very reassuring, very comforting to see that uh, the European Commission is really now putting a lot of emphasis on these traditional sectors, um, and that uh, many resources are now being dedicated to innovation in these sectors, and that, um, and that the Commission is indeed asking about international multiplication. How will we make sure that afterwards these technologies could be transferred um, while keeping, you know, at least at the beginning, a competitive advantage for the European industry? <laughs> uh, it's not about sharing everything, you know, we are not in this world. Uh, um, so obviously through the through the big multinationals which are now operating uh, in the entire world, you will have transfer of of technology is quite, uh, quite obviously from the one region to the other. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, yeah, I would say that uh, let, let's hope, let's hope that we will be able in Europe to develop the technologies we need by 2030, because it's what the commission is, is now set in this new partnership with the, with the energy intensive industries. We need the new technologies we need the, the low carbon technologies at tier L9 by 2030, you know, at the latest, so that we can be ready by 2050, you know, um, uh, at, the, at the appropriate level. So it's, it's really a race now, a race against time. And it's, um, yeah, it will be interesting to see, um, it will be interesting to see if, um, if we are all collectively able to, to deliver all these technologies in due time. As you said, in Ovendi will probably uh, be a, it's a very good first step um, mm -hmm. for global uh, research. 
Uh, I also want to remind that uh, our host, uh, University of Gustave Eiffel, is also a leader on a project that is called FASCAB. And tomorrow morning, you will have a presentation of one uh, phases uh, PhD uh, work. So on uh, accelerated carbonation, also recarbonation of concrete. And you did not mention this uh, in your uh, presentation. And this year, Lafarge Sim and Vika Cement uh, launched a new uh, industrial uh, project. And uh, I believe also this uh, way of uh, recarbonating in order to uh, improve also the recycling of concrete, because we are talking today on low carbon, but planet change and planet um, and environmental footprint are uh, also on uh, circular economy and all these global aspect of concrete. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question and uh, in the Q&A uh, question, do you think that the current EU carbon price is appropriate? Mm -hmm. And if not, in what range do you think it should be? I, it's not from me, this question. <laughs> That's a good question. So um, I think that, um, what I can say is that um, the current carbon price, um, so the carbon price has been increasing over the past two and a half years. It gave a very clear signal to, it gave a very clear signal to the sector that it has to change. Um, actually, this price has been increasing um, uh, because, um, in, not because of the of the today's situation on the market but because of the expectation that after 2021 in the new em eu emission trading scheme with the new rules which will be in place that at this time prices will uh, increase strongly so actually people are today buying allowances on the market to cover future shortages after 2021. It is anticipated that the price indeed between 2021 and 2030 will further increase. Some people tell it will increase to 40, 50 euros per ton. You have simulations which show that if you want to achieve uh, the um, a carbon neutrality scenario in the cement sector, you would need a carbon price above 70, 75, 80 euros, uh, which is today the cost of um, carbon capture and storage per ton of CO2. So, you know, if you want to cap, if you want to reduce emission up till the last ton, you know, if you will really want to achieve a zero, uh, zero CO2 sector or production process, then you would need actually to achieve this, this level of, of CO2 price. Anyway, um, what I can tell you is that with a price of 30 to 40 euros per ton, and with the new rules of the EU emission trading scheme as from 2021, the profitability of the cement sector will be severely affected. The margins of the cement players in Europe will be severely impacted. Um, uh, so it's, it's, it, it will not be by a small factor. It will, it will really have a huge impact on the profit margin of these cement companies. So, um, so today already, they know they have to move. Yeah. Today already, the signal is strong enough to make them move. It's not strong enough to, you know, to push and to, to incentivize full carbon neutrality, but it's strong enough to make them move. And that's why we see so many initiatives recently um, in, in Europe and elsewhere on, on, on this low carbon transition. But as you shown, um, as you have shown for the 5C approach of SEM Bureau, the roadmap is toward a neutral uh, neutrality on carbon on 2050. And yeah? so mm -hmm. I believe in Europe at least, uh, the cement players have understand, understood, even if uh, the tax uh, carbon is not yet uh, delivered exactly the, the price, but I believe every cement player now have understood their, um, their mission, I would say, on the planet. And, um, and there is um, another uh, way also you did not mention on uh, um, 
not only alternative fuel, but also a raw material, there is also a way of maybe doing also Portland clinker because, okay, we can substitute Portland clinker, but there are maybe also other ways of doing Portland clinker because we have also such a, um, a back, um, uh, such a, um, um, experience on this clinker. So also we are now working on how to produce Portland clinker with a lower CO2 footprint. So I believe now uh, it's very exciting when we see all what we can do. So the, 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 the worst way would be, oh, we don't have anything to do, but now we see there are many, many um, amelioration, improvement to, to, do, to be done. So that is very exciting. And that is a message for all the PhD students that are looking at this uh, session because uh, the world is open to you. So mm -hmm. I believe it's important to put your energy and your um, intelligence on this uh, smart uh, material that is concrete and cement, because as you said at the starting, we will not be able to do without this product and this material in the future for now. And uh, I will open the last question I got, and then after I think we could uh, short this um, session. Uh, you mentioned that concrete should not be used in low quality and low performance applications. In which application or product do you think concrete can be completely replaced by other less carbon intensive building materials? That's a good, that's a good question. Actually, <laughs> so there are several aspects. So perhaps I express myself wrongly. Uh, I said, what I said is that, you know, when you produce concrete, you should produce it qualitatively concrete should be a long lasting material with long lifetimes. So, so the, you know, I read, I read three years ago, I don't know if it's still valid, that the average lifetime of an individual house in India, you know, India is a bag cement market where actually people usually produce concrete by themselves, mixing up, mixing up, you know, a few components with, with relatively basic cement. The, the average lifetime of a house in India is nine years, you know, of these co of the concrete components before they have to be, um, if not completely redone, but at least uh, repaired. Uh, that's not acceptable. I mean, I mean, concrete is a material which should be properly done, properly executed. So the quality of you know, the education of users. I think that there was a very important work in Europe after the, after the war during the, you know, during these reconstruction period, a very important focus on, on educating, training, um, on, uh, you know, uh, educating people with these concrete, in concrete technology. That should be done everywhere um, because it makes no sense to, to have a material with indeed a, a high carbon footprint at the beginning, a, a relatively high CO2 emission uh, during its production process, it makes no sense to use it over very limited period of time. The advantage of concrete is its long life. Uh, and finally, second point on, on uh, replacing concrete. When I was uh, working in cement companies, we made a lot of studies about we made a lot of studies about you know the risk of substitution of concrete by other building materials actually in the in 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 20, in 85 to 90 percent of its application concrete cannot be replaced by uh, other low carbon low carbon, lower carbon, at least for the initial footprint, building materials. Um, um, so, I mean, the, 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 the substitution potential of concrete by other building materials is relatively limited. And I think it's an important information. We, we need concrete because we need its unique properties, you know, uh, it's a material which can which can be used in contact with humidity, in contact with soil. It's a mineral building materials. It has indeed um, very interesting durability features, um, and it cannot be substituted in in the in, in most 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 of its applications. Um, so substitution is not a even if you have a look at it from you know outside of the concrete sector. Uh, obviously, cement producer hate hate hearing about substitution, but substitution is not a solution for the planet. 
So, so concrete has to be improved. Concrete has to transform itself. Um, substitution is not a solution at scale for the planet. Thank you. So we are all fascinated by this subject and I believe we could continue to discuss for hours. I just missed one question and I, I will do the very last question. And um, I, I believe, yeah, about substitution is only doing uh, what is the proper material for the proper usage and on the whole life cycle of the product. Is it a building or even a city? Because mm -hmm. just looking at the material at the construction is absolutely not the way to do. We agree for that. And mm -hmm. the last question is, um, so thank you for your nice presentation. And I do the same again. Do you think that there can be sometimes a difficult choice to make between a nice building with original shapes or volumes and prefabricated buildings, which are all ident identical and meaning that with prefabrication, it is not beautiful, but I would be more, uh, can be also prefabricated and beautiful, uh, but maybe better in terms of environmental impacts. Uh, so, um, um, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> I, th I think that uh, there are many, many examples of uh, precast, you know, of prefabricating buildings, which ha which are which are extremely beautiful. Actually, you know, the ones I was just showing you on my last pictures are buildings made from prefabricated elements. So, so, um, so indeed, um, you know, sometimes um, uh, pre precast elements can be produced for a, dedic a dedicated building. I mean, more and more you have prefabrication units which are flexible enough, you know, to adapt their molds and practices to, to the willingness and to the will of, of the architect. So I'm not convinced at all that uh, uh, buildings made from precast elements are less beautiful than others. So mm -hmm. I'm not convinced at all by the starting point of this of this question. Um, I think uh, we can we can um, we can certainly um, we can certainly combine combine both. Uh, so I, I fully agree, but I believe sometimes precast or sometimes uh, ready mix. It's, it's always what is the good product, the right product in the night right process. So thank you again, uh, Bernard. That was for me a pleasure to meet you, you so around much. the table of the Phoebe PhD Symposium. I hope next time we will meet uh, in real.